All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started because I know we, we have running short on time, just an hour with us today. Um, before we go ahead and get started, I think you all are very familiar with the housekeeping rules, but I always just remind you, keep, your, keep yourself muted just so we don't have distractions throughout. Um, but please welcome you to use the chat um, to converse in there. Please leave your cameras on if you feel comfortable. I know it's the lunch hour, so enjoy your lunch, um, but we'd love to see your smiling faces. Um, the last thing to note is we're recording for those that aren't able to attend. Um, so we will have that archived on our YouTube after the session today. And before we get started, if anyone has any announcements or upcoming events they want to share, I'll go ahead and let you do that at this time. All right, nothing going on. It was a very busy week. We would have, if this would have been on Monday, we would have had a lot of announcements because we had the expo and all kinds of things going on, but it's the end of the week and I know we're all ready for the weekend. So I'll go ahead and I will turn it over to Mike Finney to do, introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Mackenzie, for the privilege of introducing Rob Painter. Rob is a close friend who I've known for over 30 years. I've watched Rob's career develop and diversify over time. He has taken on many amazing challenges over the years. Here at the Voinvich School, we like to think we helped him lay his career foundation many years ago when he was a student employee and then a professional colleague. Currently, Rob is Chief Operating Officer, Chief Financial Officer, and Co-Founder of I2 Pure Corporation, mid-sized biotechnology company focused on developing novel microbiological materials uh, to inspire greater global health outcomes. Rob is also Founder and Managing Partner of Fermented Innovations, a consultancy focused on advising and investing in early dual use and emerging technology businesses. Rob was previously a founder, founding partner at Razor's Edge Ventures, an early to growth stage venture capital fund focused on investing in businesses of value to the US defense and intelligence community. And prior to his tenure as a venture capitalist, Rob was the chief technology evangelist for Google Enterprise across the US public sector and the senior director for Google's humanitarian assistance and disaster response, working with members across the United Nations and global NGOs. Um, in addition, Rob serves as a senior fellow and special advisor to the US Joint Special Operations Command. And Rob is in his fourth year as a fellow and entrepreneur in residence at the Voinovich School. Rob is a graduate of Ohio University. And also in 2018, he was a recipient of Ohio University's Conacher Medal for Commercialization and Entrepreneurship. Rob is an entrepreneur and venture capitalist who is willing to take risks and investigate new ideas. He has a talent for seeing big picture applications for a product or concept, while at the same time willing to roll up his sleeves and get into the details to make recommendations or changes and improvements to that product or service. Rob has some great stories to tell from his broad and varied experiences. I know I'm eager to hear what Rob has to share about his public service work. So Rob, on behalf of the Voinovich School and everyone in attendance, thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule to challenge and encourage us today. So I turn the mic over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, uh, Mackenzie. And uh, just by way of uh, kind of how this you know, with this audience, this group, how the conversation, I think, can go today. Um, I'll be bouncing back and forth between some slides, and uh, to the extent I'm able to use my mouse and understand my keyboard, we'll be successful in that, and McKinsey will help if needed. So, uh, you know, nonetheless, it's, you know, I'm going to do a little bit of a practice here to kind of bring that up and give you a sense of something, if I can help this out. So, again, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the universities, most certainly, and the Voinovich School, uh, Dr. Mike Weinberg in particular, uh, of course, McKenzie, Mike, uh, Paul Benedict here at the Center for Entrepreneurship inside of the Business School, Amista is not with us today, of course, everybody who's sort of doing public service and public good and leadership within the Voinovich School and across the university. So thank you very much for that. And, you know, it's going to be an interesting conversation. I um, have probably only rewritten this about 16 times. And a good lesson for those who are giving public talks, you never apologize to your audience. Not so much of an apology, but I think it'd be more fluid and maybe a chance for conversation. I will say a couple of things. 
Um, McKinsey didn't know this. I was super excited, almost changed my uh, presentation today to uh, propaganda, public opinion, and the value of public service in Great Britain as perceived during the US, uh, in the US during the second uh, South African Boer War of uh, 1899 and 1902. I knew most folks who had joined would have found this entertaining, uh, probably a richer topic than this one. But the truth is this idea of inspire to serve is nonetheless something that is deep uh, and, and sort of intrinsic in everything that I've done in my entire life um, and had a chance to do it then the university and outside since I was uh, a member of the staff, professional staff here. So, you know, this idea when I had the chance to look back on many of the other perspectives of public service that have been put together by the Voyager schools and others, something that struck me right away was that majority of them were very specific to technical aspects of policy. Uh, some of them are very specific to sort of remarkable contemporary themes around um, just needing to do things within public, caring for the public, public policy in particular. And so as I sort of imagined those who might find value in the story, those particularly within a context of public service, those who might join as students and faculty, staff and others later, the real thing buried beneath it all is sort of the why serve to begin with. That is, why choose a life of service versus a life that you know, might have other aspects to it that somehow would be maybe less broad and more self-oriented versus outside of ourself and service. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the background. You've already heard one of the things we used to say in uh, investing, particularly in Silicon Valley, is that only on the East Coast do introductions take longer than the meeting. Uh, so my intention is not to rehash any of that. But you know, there's a lens when you hear a person's bio that looks something like this, and I've embellished it just a bit, uh, but this sort of represents, uh, scary to think about this, as Mike pointed out in his opening, that this represents almost three decades, but there's these stories of companies and roles, right? And positions that we have, and those things somehow come to define us. But what really comes to define us are the things buried beneath those things. And, you know, I would sort of say growing up on a rural small farm, I learned very early, not only this thing about hard work, but also the challenges of being in business, of trying to farm, what it means to have hard work, what it means to serve. Because in the roles that I did, my father did not own a farm. We never owned property the entire time I was growing up. Uh, my story is quite unique. There's a story there. People like story. We learned that yesterday during the expo. Folks were talking about the power of story. And in my case, my mother finished uh, seventh grade. That's as far as she had gotten. And my father got his GD in the military. I, to this day, am the only person in my family to ever go off and do this thing called college. And it makes me quite an anomaly, even today, when we think about the access to education. I'm not sure that what that says about even central Ohio, but it certainly says something about my family, which has roots in Ohio Appalachia. And so, you know, that idea of service, that idea of I had an opportunity to pursue something that perhaps others didn't, I think made an impression really young, as did that idea of when you work in farms and you do things in the farming sense, when you're young, there is very much a sense of support where you're giving to others. And, and though as a young person, you obviously may, may make a few dollars from time to time, but it really was just the thing you did with the, farm, the farms and the families that surrounded you. And so that sort of stayed with me in terms, and I think it's a, a maybe a helpful backdrop as we tell the story, because um, my career started, you know, coming out of this sort of young person mindset into U.S. military uh, for a total of about 12, 13 years, depending on how you slice it, uh, a little bit of a hiatus with really talented people in the special operations community. Uh, I am constantly force gumped into things in my entire life, and it strikes me, I must have been some idiot that was either slow to raise my hand or raise my hand early, not knowing what he was doing, but having an opportunity to serve with amazing people. And that trend kind of goes through as you look at some of the titles. My entire career, though, there are brands, as we can look back here, you know, folks will call out something like, wait, you were at Google, or wait, you did something at Northrop Grumman, or you, you were at Skunk Works and built Skunk Works at Raytheon. The reality is these were the kind of clients and kind of work that I focused on. My very first work was at the Department of Justice and the National Drug Intelligence Center in a wonderful metropolitan area called Johnstown, Pennsylvania. 
going on to the National Imagery Mapping Agency, now called the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and only in the government. They know you have to have a three-letter acronym as an agency to be cool. So NGA actually stands for the National <laughs> Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which actually has four words in it, but we will forgive the government on that one. Um, nonetheless, NEMA was the precursor for that. Navy spec warfare, I did a great number of work with the SEAL community, particularly in the littoral water zones. And how do you do overhead imagery and understand things about egress and ingress, particularly in hostile waters and waters that are ever changing as we know our coastlines are changing. Um, to work at the National Security Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office and the CIA. Um, in fact, you know, we're starting to get into these timelines of 9-11 and my, you know, uh, in terms of storytelling, uh, everyone has a memory of 9-11. My 9-11 was landing a combat in an aircraft, civilian aircraft, doing a combat landing in Macedonia because there was a civil war going on at the time. And that was the morning of 9-11. And so it was definitely a very surreal uh, next couple of months as I kind of transition roles within the Central Intelligence Agency to move into much more around the counterterrorism side of the house when I return. And so it kind of informs our life. And so many people have these points in their life where there's a call to action. We know from Joseph Campbell and every great story that every great story, of course, has sets the scene and has a call to action, right? The prince heads off to slay the dragon to return back, rescue the princess or prince and return back to the king to have some kind of great outcome. We know those are the best stories, but our lives are very much filled with those things. And these things have a choice to either influence us to make choices in terms of what we do now and how we choose to give next, or we move on and forget about them. And in this case, I continued to serve. And I think the takeaway in this is that the diversity of service I was able to kind of be part of, wearing a number of different hats, had a pretty broad view. And so that's really the landscape that comes back to, so what's the point of these profound perspectives? Um, you know, I'll stop here for just a second on, on sort of the presentation to say, there's two things that absolutely collide going forward from this point. As I started to think about service, I could not divorce myself from the fact that we've just emerged from this thing called COVID. And yet in the back of my head, there is the secondary conversation that says, are we yet not tired of this conversation? But make no mistake, and I probably will repeat this somewhere, after the pandemic, we need to accept the fact that public service is likely to be changed forever. Now, what we mean by change forever is yet being defined, I think, as we go forward. What does that change mean? What will it look like? What does it mean in terms of enrollment and participation? I think those are the things that we've yet to understand. You know, if you go back to the 1830s, there's this guy, Alex D. Uh, Jacuel, uh, he, he basically had a really interesting quote. You'll know the second part, probably not the first. And the first was that in no country of the world has a principal association of, you know, this idea of principal association ever been so successful as in America. He went on to say, this is a nation of joiners over 200 years ago. We know that Americans culturally stand up to serve to help. We witnessed that during the pandemic. But in a nation of more than 330 million people, we have yet to unlock the potential really of public service. There are some 24 million Americans that serve in some form, be it military, government, state, local, or other types of you know, service defined as public service today. But what we know about that is a couple of kind of concerning elements. We know that 6% of that workforce, only 6% in fact, are under the age of 30. We know that 30% of that same workforce, I'm sorry, 6% of that workforce is under 30. 30% uh, of that same workforce is eligible for retirement in the next five years. And one third of millennials state that they've never heard or aren't aware, just completely unaware of opportunities in serving the government or serving in public service. And 41% of you that have attended today have never considered public service in terms of joining the military. So we know that there's an opportunity for growth in terms of this notion of public service. And another uh, sort of takeaway before we talk about a few slides, which again are gonna have a bit of an overtone of COVID and maybe have some stories behind them. Um, but I would suggest as I lay out our preamble, maybe a hypothesis, I'm not sure if it's sophisticated enough to say that in an academic setting, but we must move from a spirit of service to a culture of service. 
And somehow maybe this conversation today, I'll have a chance to share maybe some pieces of that that might inspire or not inspire that very idea. So, and again, the goal here is to leave a takeaway, right? It's not just about telling stories about a person. It's also about leaving something in this form of a legacy. I think that's what our lives are about. And there may be no greater legacy than the ability to inspire young people to learn and to lead. But for the sake of the time we have together, I think what we'll try to do is have some takeaways for public service within the context and from the lens of COVID. Since we're trying to put that in the rear view lens, then we must look through the windshield to understand what we're driving. And to do that, we need to make better choices. And so in the spirit of those choices, let's make no mistake. I don't think anyone in this audience would agree or later watches the video that public service doesn't matter. But I also think we need to understand that the thing that's probably most compelling for those who are considering a life of service or to go into public service, that it's not just the job that you start in and it's not just the job that is today, it is a job of service that is ever changing and ever evolving. Obviously the pandemic was an extreme of that. But if we go back to the preamble and you take a look at the bio and you look at the places that even, you know, this Forrest Gump character from central Ohio with family in southeastern Ohio was able to force them gump, gump themselves in by simply saying, yes, I will serve, or I'm willing to try to do that. The opportunities are ever changing and evolving. And you're here it again, but this is a richer life. And so, you know, we learned clearly that public service perhaps even expanded the very notion of the term public service during the pandemic. When the idea that a grocery store worker is an essential worker or someone working in a pharmaceutical you know, uh, facility or someone who happens to be in a drugstore or someone that happens to be you know, any other service that you may not dumb to mind at first, we know that supply chain was greatly compressed. And so truck drivers became, again, essential workers. And therefore, though they were doing their daily job, they were part of that public service compendium. And I think when you go one layer deeper, and I'll not dwell on this, but make no mistake, the person that's behind the counter at the, you know, whether it's Donkey Coffee or Starbucks or Court Street Coffee or whatever your favorite is, they're also providing a bit of service. Now I'm extending it a bit further, but first we must change our perspectives. If we're going to change ourselves, then we must change the lens by which we perceive things. And the best way to do that, to touch for just a moment, my recommendation, if you take one thing away, is to say thank you to the person behind the counter and you know their name. It's on their badge in many cases. And if you watch them do that, you'll see how they change and transform. And that demonstrates in the most simplest form of my estimation, the capacity we have as individuals to change lives simply begins with a thank you. The harder step, it turns out, is to stay involved, stay active, choose to say yes and help others. But again, my goal is to inspire you to start. So again, some things just as takeaways, we have a lot of pictures, we've seen them all for the last couple of years. And so some lessons to take away as we think about my lessons of, you know, in I don't know how many conflicts down, uh, Kosovo, Macedonia, uh, Ukraine twice, of course, no conflict there at the time I was there, uh, Central and South America, Operation Just Cause. And so those aren't wonderful places, which it around. Uh, we can talk about about a handful of tsunamis. We can talk about Darfur. We could talk about servicing over 100 million meals a day in the World Food Program. Um, things that I've had a chance to touch. And you look at those and you say to yourself, we must ensure continuity of public service. And that, again, comes back to adapting to the way that we trust these services. We've always known this. And what we were learned, what we were reminded of, I should say, is the idea that during the pandemic, these things are really critical. But the cool thing, again, for those who are considering public service, as I've tried to allude to before, is it isn't just this thing that you do, like I'm going in as an accountant, I'm gonna be in public service, or I'm going into the military, or I'm going in to serve in the state house, right? I'm gonna be a policy person who's contributing to a piece of policy, or maybe will always be a policy person, or maybe in finance. But make no mistake, it's, it's what's so exciting about the field and the industry and the entire art form is the fact that it may be the most dynamic of all because of course we know why humans by definition of themselves are ever changing and dynamic and unpredictable. And that's what makes it exciting. I think the other part of the story obviously is embedded as we witness through the lens of COVID is the idea of service over self. 
And we celebrate that. We call people who are in grocery stores and folks who are on the first responders, folks that were, you know, the nursing staff that would do the 80 hours inside of the hospital without taking a break, you know, subjecting themselves to this virus. And, and by the way, these people were here before and they're here now and they will be here now because they are service, you know, that's in their core. And we have to recognize that we all have the capacity to demonstrate this service and this humanness and practice. And I think it is in doing that, that selfless service, it says something about us, not in terms of how we're judged by others, but how we judge ourselves. And the takeaway of this, of course, I mean, to leave a lesson behind, if the stories are too philosophical in nature and not inspiring enough, then the message in this case is just that we got to continue to enhance and prepare the contingency plans for future crises and activities that we can't predict. They're going to continue. We have been talking since 2014 in the administration, several administrations between this time for now, the very first serious article that had to do with any idea of a form of virus that could confront the country and therefore the country would need to react was put before all of the parties inside of the administration and year after year, it was continued to set aside. And obviously there's money going to the CDC and obviously there's going, money going to the military side of the house that's looking and exploiting these and understanding these things. But if you look at the, what was taking place in the world at the time, there was plenty of questions from a national security standpoint with regard to viruses in the wild or germs in the wild, as it were. But on the flip side of that, we just happen to know that we're creating conditions with you know, increasing uh, concentrations of public of uh, populations that are getting you know, amassed together, that inevitably one thing that's going to emerge is the fact that we're going to potentially get exposed to these things. And we equally, starting probably in 2015, and, and of course, it's always been a conversation on the side of the Defense Department, that the logistics and supply chains are always a problem. I mean, did we not witness that perhaps in Ukraine as the Russian army moved to you know, Kiev, the idea that you know, I can't comprehend it as somebody who served in the military, how we don't quite plan the logistics supply chain for that. It strikes me that had to be a big part of the case, or there's something endemic going on. But nonetheless, we also saw that our supply chains were at risk. And again, it's so easy in a context of, I don't know, not to make a speech or make any implication here that I mean that anything more than what I say, but we spend considerably more time with our devices than we spend with other people. And we cannot understand the idea of humanness, I believe entirely through a virtual context. Now, obviously during COVID that maybe was turned on its head, but as we retreat to devices and we retreat to uncertain sources for information, we're gonna prevent challenges. We must turn to our communities and prepare for them. And we must ourselves step up to find our humanness in the process. And so again, switching gears just slightly, I said I was back and forth, going back and forth on these slides, but it, it hasn't happened yet. Maybe at some point I'll figure out and, and return back to something more thoughtful. But for now, um, I think another key point I wanted to speak to is this idea of quick thinking, creativity, and innovation. You know, I don't know if I can make this connection work in this context, but it's been on my mind for the last couple of days here on campus at OU. I had the opportunity um, early this week to cross paths with, with another colleague of mine uh, here in the university that works in innovation, uh, works in entrepreneurship. And we started talking about the perception of business. And we didn't intend, I didn't intend to necessarily turn it to the perception of business across campus here at Ohio University. But it was interesting because in that context of talking about the perception of business, and you know, at any point you should ask yourself, where is this going? Uh, what I asked, you know, that sort of was interesting that prompted him to immediately take out his cell phone and show me a picture was I was trying to get at this idea, how do people perceive business or innovation or creativity within the context of other disciplines, right? So we know that we're going to need have, have our organizations our agencies, our institutions, they need to be not only culturally diverse, but they need to also have the diversity in terms of people's backgrounds, their talents, their experiences, their academic backgrounds, in fact. And so that was kind of where my conversation was headed. And of course, being involved at the business school as well as the Boney School, I was kind of asking the question towards perception of the business school. And so he showed me on his phone an informal poll Taking you know, here in Alden, I'm in Alden today at the library on campus at a university. And it was a picture of an informal poll of the coffee shop here inside of Alden. And the poll was, what is the most evil major at Ohio University? 
and without exception, uh, in fact, there were no more space on the little informal handwritten page for the check boxes. They said it was business. And there was others, you know, they had picked the columns. And of course, it's interesting, that's a school. <laughs> Is it a school that you're referring to or a major? We won't get into that. Remember, these, maybe with several freshmen, they haven't learned these terms yet. Give them a break. But um, nonetheless, it's interesting with that perception within the context of sort of our, you know, not only public policy, but, you know, it's like how long has Ilgard now the Voinovich School even when you think back to 1804 and the very construction of the university itself and the, ide I, the ideology that we would have a liberal arts program, when do you think we weren't talking about the compendium of all skills, all backgrounds, all flavors of academics? And by the way, they drive our economy because they insert somewhere. And the idea that somehow business is now this thing off to the side is kind of problematic. And so that's just a long way of coming back to this topic of innovation. Where do we think of innovation and creativity taking place? And if we haven't blurred the lines in the last decade, I mean, two decades, I don't know where you want to start it. But if Google hasn't done that, and I mean, that's what we think of, right? When we think of innovation, we think the Silicon Valley. And it's fair. We have perhaps the best IP generation in the world. But we aren't currently publishing the best amount of IP in the world. That's China. And we aren't certainly protecting our IP because that's Russia who's exploiting that IP through um, state-sponsored funds getting involved in venture capital. And so in other words, we have a brain drain, not only of really our intellectual property, but adversaries who are seeking to take it away from us. And yet we know if you want a national security and if you want to be you know, a great nation, we well, create jobs. That's the best way to do that. You do that with businesses. And so you're seeing it more and more. And I think it's a testament to bring it home to OU in this thought is there is more alignment with even the College of Communications are interacting with the Center of Entrepreneurship now. And today I, I was cross paths with a fine arts student who I thought he said finance. And so I was telling him all the wonderful things about the business school. And he corrected me after being very kind and his dad's just looking at me. Uh, he said, no, no, fine arts. And I said, oh, I, I clearly didn't mean finance, but I still meant business. Because I don't know as a fine art student how you're not franchising yourself and thinking of yourself as an independent consultant and therefore going to market to grow, right? So I still encourage you to go to the co, go visit Paul Benjamin, go to the co lab, learn about entrepreneurship and get a minor in that way in finance or in, uh, yeah, see what I mean? In fine arts. And the idea is that we should link like that. And so the idea of public service doesn't mean you have to be in Silicon Valley. And I would argue that's not where the innovation is. Um, the innovations, every place that you want to look for it, innovation does not have to be the thing that helps you, you know, draws you to TikTok. It has to be the thing that actually affects people's lives, and that's taking place in public service. And so if you really want to be an innovator and you want to be creative, go where they need you, and that's in public service. And so, you know, keeping thoughtful for time here, reliable information awareness is another key takeaway that we learned and we've always known. We've known it in the military. We've known it across government. We've known it in our own communities. We've known it if we ever joined a group on campus and we're trying to organize for our next meeting, the lack of information and awareness guarantees we're likely probably going to have to show up in the right place at the right time. And so we take away that, as you saw, even during crisis, people reached out to the government. We saw a huge increase of government websites for people seeking information. The fear was, was it correct? And so for those people who recognize the ability to serve, there's lots of jobs in the fringe of this that has to do with media content, analytics, big data, visualization, there's a place for them in public service. And again, why coming from the media? The only three things that matter in any relationship you ever have in your entire life. The only three things that will ever matter are I care for you, I'm committed, and you can trust me. And so if people don't have those things, you're not going to have a relationship that matters. As you see across countries, across borders, across uh, dorms, across bedrooms. It's not gonna matter. I care for you, I'm committed and trust. Trust takes time and we are at a period where people have real questions about those who serve. And it's a different kind of trust. We trust the firemen to put out the fire. We trust their competency. But when you go to government where the policies are being driven, people have a question. We need a generation that has said, growing up as millennials, now Gen Y, Gen Z, all of them have said, I want a life of purpose. I want a life of meaning. I don't know another place than public service to achieve that aim. And I don't know a place that has a greater call for that kind of service right now than there. 
Resource allocation takes money. As witnessed in the pandemic, there was plenty of questions. It's kind of crazy if you look at the data. Uh, during the Trump administration, we were one week away, one week before a complete shutdown. I, to my knowledge, no one's ever talked about this. And it's no, uh, myself and an MIT uh, colleague who's way smarter than I am made this observation. And the observation was we were one week away of our GDP being surpassed as a function of the deaths that were coming from COVID. And I know this is a dark thing, but we've already established a price of death. And had we continued one additional week at the current loss of life, our GDP would have gone negative as a function of failing to react to COVID-19. And the rear view mirror, it looks profound that we picked that precisely. One would argue that perhaps that was well-timed. I don't think it was planned. But this says something about allocation of resources at a very dark way. I think the positive way is we need to plan for this. We need talent for this. So we get another opportunity from another perspective of talent to be pulled in from resource allocation. We have to make available resources to the people that are doing the good work for public. I don't think that's a question. But as you see today, we, don't, we can't even get along in the aisle. So very hard to draw people into public service and we need the talent to make the stories better. We need storytellers. We need people in fine arts. We need people to give a perspective that has to be different because what's working now may not be working. And so again, you know, I've tried to be very thoughtful for the time here where we have a little bit of thoughts I can come back to. I'm gonna pause here, share these things and then take maybe some takeaways that I would call sort of the high level messages. And so the low key level messages for people that wanna operate on kind of the value in terms of lessons learned from COVID. And by the way, the lessons that have always been there in public service. So the call to action, every great story has to have that, is that we need to have comprehensive public service capital development. We need to continue to invest in that. We need to make choices that are better. And we need not to forget that that's something we have to do, notwithstanding the fact that we're reeling and folks are just now coming back to work from COVID. Never mind, we have about 3.5 million members of the workforce age 16 to about 30 years old. We actually don't know where they went into the workforce because they haven't appeared at all. They aren't in unemployment and they haven't come back. But yet we know that there's incredible opportunity for jobs that we've never seen before. And so I think that's a promise for those who not only are seeking public service, but are also seeking higher education and higher education has a hand in this. We must and can you do invest in these early warning emergency planning and preparedness quick response activities. And again, the government has not been great about this. There was a time we would say something in sort of commercial sector, we would say, you never ever are going to get fired if you buy IBM, right? Probably have heard those stages. Now I don't know what it is, but maybe it's Microsoft or perhaps that's not even cool enough. Maybe it's Amazon because you got to go to the cloud. Um, or maybe it's just you're never going to get fired if you continue to invest in cyber because of course that's about 60, 70% of all corporate budgets are going to fight and kind of defend against to protect our assets. But Where's that comparable when it comes to planning, preparedness, and response? No one ever gets rewarded for investing in these things, right? They're non-tangible in a lot of cases, but they certainly become tangible when they're needed. And of course, what do we know in number three is that we've always known we need to connect with people. Haven't we really? I'm a geographer. Mike, who's on the call from the Voinovich School. You know, geographers know and have learned something a long time ago, which is we're, we're spatial people, but we're spatial people who like to tell a story, and that's the power of a map. And we've been doing that before we could even talk. When you go to cave walls, we talk about these pictures, and these pictures tell a story. And my metaphor I like to make is we always know where the cave is, where the saber-toothed tiger is, and where the water is, right? It's like, avoid here, go there. Never mind when maybe we didn't exist at the same time in the same compendium. But the idea is that we understand how to navigate, and we understand how to communicate, and we know it's critically important. And why it hasn't changed. But when we look at you know, the mechanisms of communication, we don't have a shortage of them, we have an abundance of them. So where's the ones that are credible? And where are the ones that are credible in time of crisis? Where do people go to get the right answer? And I think that's where communities have a real opportunity. And I know that's something I've wanted, which was looking into now with the next generation, you know, bringing IoT connected devices to communities and looking to expand that to put devices in the hands of people because we're all carrying them. How do they become part of the same fabric from an early warning system and from a communication system? Wrapping up, sustained development. We know we have to continue to hold people accountable and we need leadership. Um, and, you know, that's the beauty of something and, you know, those programs that we see in business and obviously without a doubt at the Voinovich School, 
um, as leadership in the title, there is a vision that we need leadership in government. And we have maybe, my view, woefully been act lacking in leadership at the top, but certainly not leadership among those that serve. And so we have to find ways to communicate up better to understand that, you know, to inspire our leaders to understand what real leadership is about, because we seem to have lost that. And again, financial resources, have a budget, make a plan. But here's what really matters. Here's the preamble I wanted to say. The wording felt too negative to me because we're here at campus. It's, you know, we always, when you go to the campus uh, communication website and you look at a LinkedIn page or Facebook, I think the things the university talks about are trees and sunset and flowers. Uh, and so I thought I had to be positive. But I wanted to say a life without providing service to others is not a life worth living. And that is that is baked then after 30 years of my life. And so the flip side of that, to turn it perhaps more positively, is that a life of service is only worth living. In other words, there is no greater service than a service to ourself. We have what's the point of life if not to give to others? You know, so you know, I'll stop the sharing to say that why were we designed as a species to create? And what is the greatest gift that we can give? Well, life. We know that we are creators by design, and we know that we're probably servants by design, and we know that we feel more naturally inclined and happier when we're able to be in those environments providing service. And so I will have plenty a number of themes into this. The intention was both to reflect back on COVID and to try to offer a perspective as to why, and to try to make the case that there's not only more opportunity than one can imagine, but there's also more value, more joy, more happiness, even in the hard times. For anyone who believes that public service is a you know, sunshine or rainbow every single day, it'll be the, like the army said, the hardest work that you'll ever love, right? And you will never be able to get enough of it. And the problem, of course, is there's never any end to the amount of service that you can provide. And so that's why we need more of that 330 million to fill the call. And so again, we must turn that spirit of service to a culture of service. We just passed the 60th anniversary of a, of a particular presidential inaugural that said, ask not what your country can do for you. 2031, that'll be the 70th anniversary and there's aspirations for what the government should be doing and that's my call for you. You know, there's always a call for service when it's needed, but never forget there's always an opportunity to serve and you are needed now. That's what I have. And I know we have maybe barely a little bit of time. I'm going to pause there. Um, you know, there's a couple of paths uh, McKenzie I had, I had wanted to take, but I think maybe just, just see if there's some other questions. We can certainly tell some stories. I'm happy to tell you Mike Finney's story. That would be quite entertaining. Thank you so much, Rob. Really appreciate, you know, the thoughtful presentation you put together today to talk about, you know, why we do public service and the need for it. Um, I'll open it up for any questions or conversations, and I do want to hear the Mike Finney story. <laughs> Go ahead, Faith. So thank you for the presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, I uh, was never in the military, but I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And so, you know, three years in a mud hut in the middle of Central Africa. And I never perceived myself as a public servant, though. Um, right. You know, I was 22. I was uh, having the best adventure of my life, and I still consider it to be that. Um, so, you know, I'm really interested in, um, I've always been interested in the blurring of lines and, you know, getting outside silos and outside definitions. And, you know, when you were talking about the way in which you expand the concept of public service, that it could be your barista in the time of a pandemic, you know, that really reflected, I think, what, what I personally do in my daily life, which is to work with social enterprises. So, you know, for-profit firm Shagbark, it makes um, chips, but it makes chips out of, you know, locally grown grains. And so there's a huge um, jobs creation and um, local foods impact or new resource solutions, which is a for-profit company and it puts um, uh, solar panels on schools, you know, huge, amazing impact. And so to me, the, um, you know, the melding between the public and private sector is so important when you're thinking about service. And I think that you really spoke to this. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, you have other thoughts or things to say about how one can consider service and impact no matter what you do, even if it is not a formal public servant. Yeah, I'm realizing I'm shaking the camera here. I, you know, what I would say, I, first off, thank you for your service in the Peace Corps. It was service. Uh, 
Um, I think one part of reflection that I have, and again, I'm, I'm no expert in the field per se, other than one who provides service and thinks about these things from time to time. But I think there is, for example, um, if we go back to my undergraduate here, I'm gonna try to make an analogy, it may not work, but it's, it's trying to be contemporary in doing it, is that I was one of the early crazy folks that were dabbling in this thing called artificial intelligence as applied to geography. And what that really meant, by the way, it sounds pretty profound, you have to remember, like, I remember being working with Mike when we got super excited to get a 486 computer with a Pentium, with a Pentium chip. And I'm actually serious that we were probably maybe a little, both of us happy and surprised by that. And I think it had the very first Windows version of Windows, which went on to be quite notorious in Windows 3.1 for work groups. It still wakes me up in the middle of the night. But the point is, you know, it became almost laughable when we spoke about this term artificial intelligence then. We could only really perform sort of the supervised versus unsupervised classification over one chip of an image over maybe what would be equal to, you know, in the Virginia military uh, survey, you might have not quite a township, right? Because again, you had to take the compute, you have had a model and you get an analysis, but what was really cool is you could do this unsupervised, you could say, what is forestry? What is not forestry? What is land use, right? Well, now we do that, this, let's scale. But we went through a period, it was almost heresy to talk about the term artificial intelligence. So if you fast forward, the trick in sometimes these words is that, again, I told you the beauty of communication is it uses words. The problem of communication is it uses words. We have to simplify. And so when we say public service, the fear that I would have is that particularly when I talk about the importance of budgets, that if we broaden public service to be too many things, as long as we understand the context, it's great. But I don't want to broaden it so much that those who actually are in a more traditional sense doing public service, we forget about the fact that those have a different kind of budget context than the person behind Starbucks, right? Starbucks in the current vernacular is kind of an exciting time because there's a labor challenge going on right now. So it's another weird analogy. But I do think to the extent that we think about public service more broadly, I do think that, one, again, my other hidden takeaway here is your life is enriched. Right. So in that context, I believe our goal is to serve others. I believe that is our purpose. I believe that is the model to live it. It's not easy. Right. I so wanted to, and I and I wish I could bring it up. But if I can't bring it up during this talk, I will. But I think uh maybe is there a chance I can do this? All right, I'm gonna go. I think I can. I don't I can't believe that actually worked. Well, it hasn't worked yet. That's my license plate. That has been my license plate in Virginia since I moved to Virginia. I often ask people, I've had people come up to say, what's S3, R3, R3, military? It must be a military thing because S3 actually stands for something in the military. No. When I was raising capital for my fund, people would often say, you're the guy that's all about service, right? And so the idea of service, I think, is pretty broad. And I don't think I want to lose sight of that. So I think that's number one. Number two, I think there has to be sort of this connotation that there isn't the military in the rest of the world. You know, I served having experienced uh, folks who had just returned. In fact, one of my closest friends at the time was the head of the IPT camp in Darfur. Um, she was about 30. She, you know, super sharp, amazing, low key person hanging out in Geneva. She was the deputy that was running all logistics for the World Food Program. Uh, that meant that about 25 people were, were essentially orchestrating the delivery of 100 million meals a day. And there was a really close partnership and it continues to be a close partnership today between those NGOs and the US government. How do you think we facilitate care? How do you think we facilitate the World Food Program? And so when you said, you know, the idea of Peace Corps, that's what came to mind. And it's not us or them in the same way that it's not business and, you know, environmental studies or business versus coal mine runoff in a context of those that may be from Southeastern Ohio. It's about togetherness in terms of what comes next and what future we want together and what future we want to resolve. And so I don't know if that closed the loop or made it comparable, but one, careful with language. Two, don't forget that you know public service need additional budgets. And three, there is no other life that's worthwhile. And I think it is expanding. The idea is, can I bait you into public service through another mechanism that's, that, that lets you change your perspective of what it means to have service? Pretty soon, when you start recognize how that feels to be participating in that, 
you want to do more. And the likelihood is then I can pull you into maybe what we call quote unquote real public service for those among us who buy into that, right? So maybe there's something to that. Long answer. That was great. Um, I think I think the answer was no, very clever, but no. <laughs> But I would I would love to have a conversation with you about um, the social sector and how, in my opinion, it really does meld between um, the public and, and, and private sector. In any case, um, no, I really appreciated that. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, speaking of self-interest, I can hear my contractor just coming to my door. So I'm going to go and deal with my garage roof. But um, thank you so much. I really you mean your public service specialist? Anyhow, <laughs> I got to keep up my script. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Faith. Um, I have a question in the chat here coming from Pam. Um, she's asking, what are your thoughts about improving pay for public servants? We want to do good, be a part of our community. And what do you think about the future of competitive pay and professional development for public um, work, especially post competitive hiring environment? Yeah, 100%. I mean, there's no denying Pam asked, I mean, an absolutely relevant contemporary question, uh, not to, you know, what would be what would the right term be? Uh, I'm not trying to call out anyone like any, say the board of trustees or the, you know, any of those at a high university or any other university right now, but across the entire compendium in the state of Ohio right now, as we see in universities, we're seeing you know, opportunities for pay increases that aren't even remotely congruent with the cost of living. And the reality is it's very, you, know, you end up having to have the story, right? That I must do public service and therefore must sacrifice. And the real challenge is, you know, even among universities, you're seeing talent pull from great universities, other universities, because of any number of reasons. But it always comes back to the idea that equal pay for equal work. And then, by the way, we still have this debate since, since we first started to talk about any kind of labor issues going all the way back to, we made reference to Kennedy earlier. Like, these are always been endemic in our population. But the reality is... You know, those who serve are sometimes also the equal ones that are left behind in terms of the public budget. And the reality is we have to make investments in that. And the historic view had been, well, if we could reduce a lot of our defense spending as a function of, I don't know, promoting peace and better, you know, ideas that we can do through, democ you know, the idea that we could have diplomacy, that maybe there's an opportunity to turn some of the back to our country. And the reality is, well, of course, you have to do all things at all people at all times. And, it, and, and that has been hard to become material. But that question that I think is asked now is, I think, more timely than ever, because, of course, we're, again, there's a good and a bad, because one of the things about coming out of a pandemic is people are going to say, well, we're just coming out of a pandemic. And at what point do we stop saying we're coming out of a pandemic as an excuse for these things? The reality is there are budget compressions. And so, you know, absolutely, there should be, and there's a real question as we think about, you know, this whole idea of taxes, right? And, and you have inflation. And so there's going to be a natural tendency to inspire businesses from a tax cut, but yet you got to move those dollars into public service. And so these are the same pressures always experienced. I do think they're amplified. And so the answer to the question, absolutely. I think, you know, as you see your students graduating, Right. I mean, we talk about artificial intelligence. Well, the problem is there's tremendous opportunity in artificial intelligence or cyber, but there aren't anybody in those jobs because there's only a few people that are hiring them. And in fact, the skill levels even drop to the point where I don't need a whole heck of a lot of competency before I get a six figure job. Explain to me again why I want to go do public service. Why would I want to do big data or big data analytics or machine learning or all these contemporary things and small communities. Why does Walston's mayor need that for, you know, I'll, you know, bring my imagery back, uh, a memory back for Mike of the permitting. And whenever the, you have to build something and you got to go to the, the office and the auditor's office to make, get a building permit. You know, like I remember the first time they got a piece of software to think about that. Like, oh, we should be more predictive in that process, right? Instead of like catching people and giving them the ticket when they didn't. How about just, you know, having them fill out the application for the permit after we look at it overhead with imagery that says, looks like you built a porch on. I mean, become a partner, but I'm getting too deep into that. The point is we got to find efficiencies to bring competency. And so, yes, absolutely. Should we be more thoughtful about that? And I don't quite know where that comes from. I do look to those big players, um, you know, from Google and others, but it was also something you know, I won't spend time on this, but you kind of ring, it rings home to me in more ways than I can answer to you in the time we have. But you probably heard of google.org at one point. 
Um, you know, Larry Brilliant's TED Prize that sort of started that. My job, essentially, I dismantled Google.org, not because I didn't believe in Google.org, but because I didn't think we needed another NGO. What I thought we needed was to put technology that's freely available and inspire people to use the technologies of Google to respond to crisis. In other words, stop with the idea that we're going to grant money. Instead, do the thing you do well. And so I think there's something to that. There has to be more public-private partnership at the end of the day, I think, to pull it off. And again, for the fourth time to reiterate, yes, pay should be more equitable or else you're not going to get people in service. Or if you're going to do work in a commercial sense, then follow a model of an 80-20 model where one day of your week is in service, you know, particularly in profitable organizations. We did that at Google for a while. So, I mean, you got to have creative business models to do it, but we need people in service and we got to find a way to make it equitable. I know McKenzie has herself a big question. I was checking to see, does anyone, we have a little bit more time left if anyone has one last question. Go ahead, Jay. Hey, Rob, how you doing? Uh, so I'll say as a fellow combat engineer, SEONs. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so anyway, so uh, real quick, I know uh, you talked a little bit about, uh, so I'd be interested in on what drew you into the military, because usually there's a story behind that. I think that'd be worth sharing, because you know, there are only less than 1% actually of our U.S. population serves on active duty. So, and then, so how do we continue to draw in that talent? And then not only that, but how do we, not just for in the uniform, but those are certain publics or how we bring them in and then how do we, you know, retain them? These are, I mean, with six minutes left, Mackenzie, uh, <laughs> I don't think we can get that, but I think, you know, yeah. just some, maybe some real snippets in that, Rob, it might be helpful for the group here. Yeah, a two part, I think there's a two part answer for me. Mackenzie's like, isn't there always a two point answer with you, Rob? Uh, you know, the first part is, I think it's easier on the first part, which is, um, Probably my opening preamble is a bit of a bellwether for the answer. And that is, though there were a couple of universities, perhaps because they had, my, they had a misspelling of my last name, that were courting me to come and uh, engage them. You know, I remember them almost, I remember the letters of like, hey, there might be some scholarship money here for you. And that had to be laughable because I did not have great grades in high school. Um, and it was Otterbein and maybe Akron. I uh, grew up in Ohio, and I was pretty sure that it was mailed to the wrong house. Um, and the basis for that was it didn't take me very long as an independent sort of thinker to recognize I was, there was no money. There was no way that was going to work. And so the better and the concluding answer to that is I recognize that with the Army College Fund, my entire family, my, uh, my uncle and my father had both served. And, you know, I actually, at the start of my senior year in high school, um, even though I was trying very hard to take college prep classes, I guess, because I enjoy comedy, uh, I knew that I was going to the military and that driver was first, you know, serve. And second, I had a benefit. If you look at the calendar was something called the army college fund, the army college fund tied to the GI bill. So I actually made a nice paycheck, uh, for my four years by coming to school that was certainly greater than the cost of education and the benefit of having been away from my family allowed the cost of education to come down because I was independent and I qualified for some grants. One of those grants actually found my way to Mike. I left the Veteran Affairs Office working at OU my first job and got picked up as under PACE, Program to Aid in Career Exploration, which is essentially almost a set-aside grant to do that. I would not even be in the field that I'm in if that had not happened. And so synchronicity, so that's why the military was money for school. But I don't know why I stayed, because the problem is I left three times. Like, I'm out, I got my DD-214, I got called, I felt the call to go back. Of course, I got recruited coming to Ohio, but I then go on in my career to Pennsylvania. My, Mike may not or not know this, may or may not, but even when I got to Pennsylvania working for what was then tasked working at a drug intelligence center, one of the guys who's a captain in the guard found me. He's like, hey, you're that military guy here. I started here. What did you come in? Come back in. And I don't know why I said yes. So there is this natural tendency to serve. The flip side of that, how do you draw them in? I mean, I, I'm, I don't know, right? I think there's two sides of that. One is we're coming out of a couple of conflicts where people, I think, are very concerned 
we're losing, you know, every six hours you're using, losing a soldier to suicide. I think it's hard to talk about the benefits if that's your view. And so we know we have to do better healthcare. We know we have to address that. The flip side of that, we know we need competency. And one of the things about our current standing military and all branches that are remarkably talented in terms of the technology. And so a two year, three year stint, you're coming out with a competency that you can assuredly step into a job that's you know, in the upper echelon, just under three, you know, probably six characters. Um, so six figures of an income coming out of a three year stint inside of the military, particularly if you chose well, right? And there's plenty of opportunities to do that. The flip side of that is additional money for school to go on, which by the way, under the new GI Bill actually applies to members of your family. And so I think there's more of a story to tell around the combination of service. And may, it's not just the military, but I think other opportunities we have to serve if we don't learn something, we, clearly we're gonna learn something there. And in fact, I think it rounds us out as individuals, but also by the way, for young people, it rounds out that resume and it demonstrates this things called experience. You know, So again, having an advantage coming to LU as an undergrad, I had three years of experience doing something real, right? Building bridges and you know, visiting parts of the world. And so, you know, again, I think it's that part of the story that you have to, we have to tell more of I don't think it's a choice. And I do think there's more appetite than ever, more, you know, less negativity around the military. I just don't know that people think of it as a first option. But I think on the flip side of that, how are we actually matriculating people into jobs after four years? And if you look at that number, we know that there's plenty of millennials, and no joking aside, over 50% of the males are still hanging out on their parents' couch. We have the single most education generation, this generation, and the one prior to it absolutely the most education in the history of time, and yet they're not in the workforce. Now, certainly the, the COVID didn't necessarily help that, but it definitely, by the way, only further you know, concentrated that. And I think that's the thing about the military is an opportunity to put experience in hand with our ability to get that competency and those skills. And I think that's gotta be a richer part of the story. And by the way, you can do that while still being in school. I think that's another part of the story to communicate more of too. So I don't know if that gets at it, but I think that's pieces of it for sure. And I think Mackenzie's gonna say. Yeah, thank you, Rob, appreciate it. You bet, you bet. thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Thanks, Jeff, for the great question. Um, we are right at one o'clock, and I know, Rob, you are, your wife is coming to town for OU Moms Weekend, so I wanna be conscious of time. And thank you for taking the time today to talk with us. I know many- Thank you forward to the recording as well. Um, before you all head out for the weekend, just want to send one final reminder of the save the date for our next and our final session of the semester, which is hard to believe. It's that, you know, mid-April already um, wrapping up the school year, but per, uh, the assistant professor of geography at West Virginia University, Jamie Shin, she'll be coming to talk to us about flood recovery. Um, so I hope you can join us next Friday for that session. Thank you so much again, Rob, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mackenzie. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Rob. You, you bet.